So, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to my talk about nine Java patterns that Kotlin made obsolete. Um, I'm Sebastian, I'm an engineer at Mimacom, and uh, I love correcting, I, I'm sorry, excuse me, I love educating people about cone style, especially in regards to Kotlin. Um, I've been using the language for the past three years, so I have some experience with it. Um, this is, is essentially my plan today. Don't know if you know the meme, um, but I'd like to convert some of you Java folks to might or maybe consider Kotlin in your next project. Um, if you get more concrete, um, this is what we'll look at today. It's nine patterns. I'm not going into detail of uh, how Kotlin works or does it better, but just demonstrate that certain patterns are just obsolete and, and better with Kotlin. So yeah, as the time is uh, pretty short, I'll jump right into it and start with the optional pattern. Um, who hates null pointers exceptions? Well, of course we all do, right? So that's not a question. But that's why we have optional, right? Well, the thing with optional is that it doesn't solve the problem, really. It just wraps it. And I can demonstrate this with, with, uh, with this. It's, optionals are all right for return values, um, assuming we have a function that returns an optional string. And if you feel like it, we can re return a string with a value, and otherwise we return an empty string. But the thing is that nothing keeps me from writing this. Well, maybe my architect or my reviewer um, will complain, but Java doesn't complain. Java will, will let me uh, write this code, or if I better say, this crap. So it's not so great for parameters either, and Java doesn't recommend you doing, using them for parameters because it's just way easier to pass null than an empty optional, right? So it's not useful there. And I mean, properties, I'm not sure if I've ever seen this code. Let's not even talk about it. So to summarize, uh, it protects our uh, return values, but it shouldn't be used on params or props. It doesn't solve nullability, but it's functional, which is nice. So how can we do better? Well, you might have guessed it, we can use Kotlin. Um, Kotlin does this a little bit different because nullability is built into the type system. So for every type, be it primitive, library, or, uh, or custom types, there always exist two variations. One which is not nullable, in this case string, and one that's nullable, string with a question mark. So if you have a string um, that's not nullable, it's never going to give you null. But if you have a nullable string where you can assign null, you know that it might let you down. So that's something to bear in mind. And the cool thing is that the compiler enforces this. So it will give a compiler error if you want to assign null to string, because it's not nullable. At the same time, um, if we access a nullable type or a nullable variable, um, the compiler will complain because, hey, you haven't checked if that's null. You first need to check that if it's null, and if it's not null, then you can access the value. So it's a compile time check. And the cool thing about this, it works on everything. It works on return types, parameters, properties, and even generics. So if you have a list of strings that are not nullable, you can't add null to that list. So that's pretty great. And that's my takeaway number one. The nullable types are mightier than the optional. So let's look at the next pattern, overloading methods. Um, we've all learned that in school, um, overloads, is, it's like you call the next function um, with, with uh, like default values for your parameters, and you end up doing something like this, where you have a function with three uh, parameters, message, level, and context, all of this, or type string. And you call them like this. You can call it with just a message, and we'll take info as a default value. You can provide defog uh, as a level, or you can even provide a context. But how do you uh, pass a default level and a custom context? Well, sadly, we can't. We can't do that in Java, because if we have a, not a function that has, uh, that's just missing the level um, parameter, the, the signatures collide. So we can't do that in Java. In Kotlin, we can, because the first thing you notice is we only define the function once. But we add something called default arguments uh, to those parameters. So level and context actually have a default value. So if you don't pass a value, we'll take that one. As you can see on the caller side, um, we can use something like named arguments, where we specify, hey, it's not just a position that, uh, that is relevant for the argument, but also we can just tell it. 
Like in the last example, we can just say, hey, the second, that UI string that I'm passing, that's actually the context uh, parameter. So that's nice. So takeaway number two is use default and named arguments and not overloading. It's not necessary. Let's take a look at the next uh, pattern, utils. Ever heard this? Too much code or um, shared code? Yeah, put it in the util class. Sure. Yeah. And then we end up with something like this. It's a class, number utils, it's a static function that checks for uh, if an integer is even, for example. And then, in another code far away, we call it like this, number utils that is even and we pass our integer. So that's, that's what we were taught in school, right? But what does that have to do with classes and object orientation? The only reason that this is a class is because Java can only do classes. So that it doesn't really look object-oriented, right? So the Kotlin way of doing this is actually to define something called an extension function on existing type. As you might have guessed, you can define that on any type, everywhere in your code. So in this example, we just create an extension function is even on the type int. And then, in our code, we can just write two dot is even, which looks a lot more object-oriented already. Only thing I'm missing now is being even is more like an attribute, so more like a property rather than a skill, so it shouldn't be a function. Luckily, we can define that too. So we can just define an extension property with Kotlin. So that looks a lot more OO to me. So takeaway number three is extend classes with extension functions and properties, not util. So speaking of useless classes, let's take a look at the factory pattern. We have, um, in this, I have an example for this. We have an interface notification which has two concrete uh, implementation classes, SMS notification and email notification. Um, and then we write factory functions, right? So factory classes, they have, again, a static uh, function create notification where we pass a type. And this is what it looks like if we call that uh, factory. So notification factory dot create factory, and then we pass the notification type. Not so oh right? It doesn't look like object-oriented code. So what you do in Kotlin, actually, you just define a function. Kotlin is, has a first-class support for functions, so you can just define top-level functions. And you can name your function exactly like the interface does. That's not a code smell. The coding conventions actually allow that. And when we call our function, while notification equals notification, it looks just like a constructor call. Because there is no new keyword in Kotlin, it look, looks exactly like we would call a constructor, which is what we're doing. We are instantiating a type uh, not, uh, or um, a new notification, right? So that looks a lot more O to me. And that's also takeaway number four. Prefer functions to classes whenever possible. They're easier to write, they're easier to test, and just make a lot more fun. Let's take a look at a singleton pattern. And here I start with a code sample. Um, this is more or less the code that gets generated by IntelliJ if you uh, just write singleton and then type generate singleton. Uh, what comes to mind? So to my mind, it's this, boilerplate. Much code, little use. And if you take a little closer look, you can actually see that this isn't even the thread safe. So that's, uh, that's a problem of writing boilerplate code. It's error prone, right? But singletons is something we use a lot sometimes. So if we want to improve that, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is a singleton really? It's one single instance of a clause, or also known as an object, right? So Kotlin uh, uh, lets us define that. We can just write object singleton, and then put our properties and method inside that object, and Kotlin will do the rest for us. Yeah, it's thread safe. Kotlin checks that and does it right. And yeah, it's also lazy, so it's initialized on first access. So takeaway number five is never write singletons, only ever use objects. You don't need singletons in Kotlin. You have objects and functions. So let's take another look at the builder pattern. We have uh, some code here. Um, we create a new builder. 
Uh, we pass a name, we pass a first name, we can pass a year, and then we have maybe some util function that uh, sets, creates our Bruce Wayne without parents, and then we build our person. So, nice. It's an example of a builder. But why do we use builders? Like, it's a question. Why do we use them? For validation, maybe? Well, not really. Um, clauses should uh, check their data themselves, so they, they're responsible to be consistent, right? So we can, we can scratch that. Maybe because constructors get too big? Well, yeah, kind of. It's a problem with Java, as we've seen, um, but not so much with Kotlin, because you have default and named arguments, so that's not really an issue. Maybe this to build and configure complex objects. Well, yeah, that's exactly why we should use builders. And I've brought here an example uh, from Spring with uh, Mock MVC, that's a uh, library to test um, your controllers. So you can do, you can make, a, um, you can make a, a HTTP request with it. And in Java, builder code often looks like this: like you have some builders, you call functions, you pass them to other functions, you uh, you do method chaining. So it's kind of okay, but it doesn't. It's not really that readable. And apparently, the Spring team thought so as well. So they introduced a Kotlin DSL for this. The uh, DSLs are domain-specific languages. And if things get complex, strive towards using those DSLs. Here, the Spring team rewrote th this DSL, and now it looks like this. It's not a lot less code, but it's more readable, for sure. And you don't need to learn a new language or something. It's just plain Kotlin. If that example maybe was a little bit too complex for you, um, I have a simpler example for um, essentially the simplest example that I could find. It's, um, it's how to build maps in Java. Like in, you would just write map.off and then you provide comma separated key value then key value. Um, it's okay, but it's not really that nice. Kotlin provides a, a builder function to create key value pairs. It's called two, so that's an infix function. So you can just write key one, two, value one, and it creates a pair of key values. And then you can just pass a list of key value pairs to the map of function, which builds the map for you. Because that's essentially what a map is, right? A list of key value pairs. So that's takeaway number six. Don't be afraid of those DSLs. They sound scary. Learn to love them. Apply them. And essentially, eventually, write them yourself. So let's talk about the iterator pattern. Um, it's very useful, but sadly, the iterator pattern is mostly imperative. So, as you can see, we first uh, we have a collection, and then we create our iterator. In the while loop, you uh, check if it has a next item, and then you actually have to call next to get the next item. So, it would be nicer just to write a for each loop, right? Yes, it would be nicer. So in Kotlin, we can just write for item in collection, and we just iterate over everything. And now you're saying, well, that obviously works on collections, just that it does in Java. I mean, that's easy. Everybody knows it. The thing is, with Kotlin, it works on everything. So everything that has the iterator operator function. Um, I'm going to show an example of this. Assume we have a school that has uh, students and teachers. And then we define an operator function on the school, as it's an extension function as well. And we first did yield all uh, teachers, and then we yield all students. And then in our code, we can just write for person in my school um, to iterate over first all teachers and then all students. So that's a lot more readable than uh, having to somehow merge those uh, two collections and then iterate over the collections. So that's quite nice. So takeaway number seven is use operator functions. They're there for a reason. Um, you can essentially overload every operator, like plus, minus, uh, uh, equals. Uh, you can overload all those operators. Use them. Speaking of operator functions, let's take a look at comparable. And I have an example here. Um, we have a class movie um, that has title, uh, which is a string, and a year, which is just an integer. And the cool thing is now, if you want to compare those uh, movies by year, for example, maybe we need to sort them or whatever, 
um, either in Java you pass a comparable, or you implement, or, or you implement comparable, or you pass a comparator, right? So in Kotlin we can just define the operator function compare to, um, compare the years directly, and then in our domain logic or in our logic, the thing that is actually relevant, we can compare them directly. So four is smaller than five, then we get into that if statement. So I want to uh, quote Robert C. Martin here. So if you want to go fast, if you want to get done quickly, if you want your code to be easy to uh, write, make it easy to read. And that's my takeaway for now. Think of the reader and not the writer. So if we focus ourselves on writing the logic, the thing that actually matters, that uh, generates business value, to be easy to read um, by writing some extension functions, um, locally in your file, you don't pollute any uh, scope at all. It it um, it's a lo uh, it's a huge benefit essentially. So um, I'm already in my last pattern, the strategy pattern. Have you ever heard of the docs? It's a common example that gets used with the strategy pattern. It's essentially you have um, a, a an abstract uh, doc that can have multiple implementations of that. For example, the Mallard doc. Um, and the Red Hat doc, that all of those can fly, but then you add your rubber doc, and that can't fly, right? So um, what you do is essentially you uh, extract the fly behavior, so you create an interface fly behavior, and you implement two versions of that. We have a Java example here, um, where you have the interface flying, and a fly behavior, and a no fly behavior. Um, yeah. Then you have the abstract class doc, which implements flying, and you have your mallard doc, which extends the normal doc. And then, because doc implements flying, you need to implement every uh, method in flying. Um, so here it's just fly, but it could be more than that, right? Um, and all these methods do is delegate to their behavior, right? So that's all they do. So in Kotlin, we can make this a little bit simpler. Um, first, we define our interface and our behaviors, just as we would in Java. It's essentially exactly the same, just in Kotlin syntax. But this is all the code we require to uh, implement those methods. Looks confusing, right? But it's really uh, ingenious. You can define your class, which, or, or your mallard doc, which is a doc. And then you say, hey, I implement the flying interface, but the implementation is done by fly behavior. So you de can delegate the implementation of a whole interface to another object which is called interface delegation. And I mean, compared to this code, it's just a lot cleaner and a lot nicer. We've used this in a project and it was really useful. It um, allowed us essentially to make compositions way easier. So that's takeaway number nine. Kotlin isn't just a fancy syntax. It's a new way of life. Just kidding. Uh, Kotlin isn't just fancy Java syntax. It's a different kind of programming. You can't expect just to to uh, learn the Kotlin syntax and then write uh, Java code, essentially, with a different syntax, you need to rethink how you're programming. There are many things that you can do easier with Kotlin. And with that, with a little bit uh, earlier than expected, um, yeah, I want to give my key message out to you. Go and check it out um, and start programming with Kotlin. And I would like to, to thank you um, for your attention. Um, this has been my first talk, so if you like, you can give me a feedback. Um, it's really appreciated. If I've hooked you um, and you've, I've catched your, uh, caught your interest, check out my blog. Um, I've written about nine mostly different uh, patterns that are also obsolete now um, in Java. Uh, check out these slides if you want, and uh, yeah, hit me up live or on social media if you want to talk about Kotlin, CodeStyle, or anything else. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>